Well, again, let me say that I'm grateful for this opportunity. I appreciate the elders inviting me to come, and I'm very thankful to be in fellowship with you this week. Um, I've known of the church at El Bethel for a number of years, but this is my first chance to visit with you, and, uh, and I'm excited about that prospect and glad to be here. My experience is that when I'm with a, a group of saints who've been at this a while and good teachers, I always uh, gain about as much as I give in reference to a meeting, and I'm, I've already profited from being with you, and I'll uh, be uh, asking more questions and trying to gain more help in my walk as a Christian, and I will look forward to the time that we share together. Uh, we are going to talk this week, Lord willing, about the wisdom literature. I, I've certainly spent a good bit of time trying to read from the wisdom literature and understand it because of my own deficiencies and need for wisdom. Uh, but I've never really taught this series just this way. I've taught from all these books and all these lessons in different ways, but the challenge for me is going to be putting them all together and uh, being able to chop them in pieces that still make sense and that I can still try to do justice to these great works. Um, we are going to talk more from Proverbs today. We've begun that already. And then, Lord willing, tomorrow we plan to talk about the book of Job from the standpoint of looking at Job as the sufferer in the dark and then his friends as these self-deceived saints who come to help him. And then, Lord willing, uh, Tuesday night we plan to talk about the enemy in the book of Job and the work of Satan and how he works. And then uh, Wednesday we'd like to talk about uh, Jehovah in the book of Job, which I think is the point, isn't it? And the really great lesson that uh, comes uh, from God's speeches to Job. And then, Lord willing, uh, on uh, Thursday and Friday, we want to talk from Ecclesiastes and think about uh, the dead end roads that many people choose in life that are not new at all, that Solomon warned us about so many years ago. And ultimately, Friday night, about the life that brings satisfaction, the life that's worth living the whole of man. So that'll be our plan for this week. Uh, I don't know that, uh, that I'll do it justice, but certainly the material is worth it. <laughs> That's one great thing about it. And I don't think anybody in the audience here would say, well, I just don't know why we're wasting time studying the wisdom literature. I mean, the world is just filled with common sense. It looks like to me people are doing pretty well in reasoning and thinking. Nobody that uh, has any perception feels that way. I'm not a political animal and I'm not here to talk politics. I try to stay away from the news, to be honest with you, uh, as much as I possibly can. Uh, some of it you have to see. I'll tell you why it's just so depressing to me. And it might, if I'm not careful, at least for me, it might tempt me away from remembering the fact that God's in control and he's going to, you know, maybe sometimes he raises up crazy people to punish us. I don't know. But I couldn't, I think all of us, whether we wanted to or not, were made aware of uh, recently when in our Congress they were, uh, what's the process called there, they were vetting this candidate for the Supreme Court. Now, this is a candidate for the United States Supreme Court put before Congress, a person who will be one of nine people who will answer the most difficult legal questions in the country. They don't get, uh, you know, uh, the uh, dog catcher uh, cases up there. Uh, they get the most difficult cases, important cases that affect the lives of Americans. Here's someone who is to know the answers. And they asked this person, they said, what is a woman? Pass. Too hard to figure out. This would, this is beyond parody. It would be funny if it were not so deadly serious. No, we need wisdom. Because the world has lost its mind. Our society has. So we need to be called back to the wisdom of God. And when we say here how to win at life, uh, maybe that's too casual a, uh, a title, but 
it occurs to us that the world doesn't even know what the word wind means in this context. That's really what Ecclesiastes is going to do for us, is define what it means to win in life. But I do believe that the, that the wisdom literature has the answers for us. Now, when we say wisdom literature, we're primarily talking about Ecclesiastes, Job, and Proverbs. These are the books we classify generally as wisdom literature. And that might raise a question with some of the younger students here. I realize, by the way, that this audience has, has been through the wisdom literature a number of times. Many of you have. And so I may not teach you anything new. I hope to reinforce some things. But for some of those who are younger who may not have been through these books as many times, uh, I hope you have uh, a growing love for these books because they are so practical and so valuable. And when you spend time in meditating on these books, that's the one thing that comes across is, man, this could have been written yesterday. But uh, someone might ask the rather basic question, why do we call these books wisdom literature? It, it, it all inspired. We got a whole book full of wisdom, don't we? Well, in a sense, that's true. But they're the, called the wisdom literature because, well, there are several words in the Bible in the Old Testament for wisdom, for example. The word chokmah, I don't think about Hebrew, but that word is one of the common words. I think it's used, uh, I don't know, near 200 times in the Old Testament. And I believe 70% of those usages are in these three books. So what does that tell us? It tells us that these are the books that concentrate on wisdom as a subject. That's why we call it the wisdom literature. These are the books that God has given us to teach us about wisdom as a subject. And I think that the lessons that are there are extremely important. I'm going to start out with the most commonly associated book in reference to wisdom, and that is the book of Proverbs. And uh, in Proverbs chapter 1 and in verse 1 beginning... We begin with the words, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction. To perceive the words of understanding. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. To give subtlety to the simple. To the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain to wise counsels, to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. It's a book about wisdom. What is wisdom? That's an interesting question, isn't it? You know, it, it's, uh, it's a basic question, but it might be a little bit difficult. How do you answer that question? How do you put in a few words what wisdom is? Some smart fellow might say, well, it's the opposite of folly. Good point. <laughs> but maybe there's uh, more to be said about it. Uh, somebody might say, well, it's applied knowledge. All right, I wouldn't argue with that, but maybe there's more to be said yet. I find it interesting that not just me, but maybe smart fellows, they struggle sometimes. To, they don't always define the word the same way. It's interesting uh, in the ISBE, uh, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, if you look under wisdom, it will describe it this way. It's the art of reaching one's end by the use of the right means. Uh, Clinton and Strong say, in a general sense, it is a comprehensive knowledge of things in their proper nature and relations, together with the power of combining them in the most useful manner. Uh, Wilson's word study says simply to have understanding. So what is wisdom? Wisdom is an art. Wisdom is power. Wisdom is understanding. Wisdom is knowledge. It's all those things. You know what's interesting in the Bible? This word for wisdom, the most common word here, uh, Hokma, is used in a number of different contexts. Sometimes it's not even used of good people. Wisdom might be the word that is used to describe someone who is really skillful at a particular trade. Or it might be even a fellow like Jonadab, who was a rascal. But uh, he had a shrewdness about him that was uh, uh, very uh, effective in his own way. But the wisdom we're talking about in the wisdom literature is always coupled with the fear of the Lord. That's what he's advocating there. 
For example, in the ninth chapter of Proverbs and in verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. And that's right, the fear of the Lord. True wisdom is always coupled with the fear of the Lord. There's a shrewdness that the world has, but wisdom is the fear of the Lord. I like this quote from a guy named Derek Kidner. He was an Anglican. He's probably gone now. But um, years ago in Urban's Bible Handbook, he had a little squib on wisdom that I thought was worth repeating. And he said that secular philosophy tends to measure everything by man and comes to doubt whether wisdom is to be found at all. This is written 40 years ago. Certainly no less true now, is it? But the Old Testament, with this motto, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, turns the world right way up with God as its head, His wisdom, the creative and ordered principle that runs through every part, and man, disciplined and taught by that wisdom, finding life and fulfillment in His perfect will. That's exactly right. That that one way to think about wisdom, going back to our question, how do you define wisdom? Wisdom is getting in line with the will of our Creator. That's maybe the best I can do with it. That's what wisdom ultimately is. It's man humbling himself and following the will of his Creator. Now that's simple to say, but that's no small thing. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but gas has gone up recently. Uh, it's, it's incredible to me. And the guy pulls up at the gas pump, and he's got his diesel truck there. And he says, diesel is $7 a gallon, and I don't want to pay that. Well, this unleaded is just $6 a gallon. What a bargain. He said, I think I'll put that in my diesel truck. Well, you can do that, but it won't work. And you try it long enough, nothing will work. You're going to have, to, uh, you're going to have the whole thing ruined, burn out. Now we understand that. But, you know, the application is this. God did not make us to run on sin. You can try that, but it won't work. It won't bring happiness. It doesn't bring fulfillment. And ultimately, it can leave us ruined to the point where nothing will work. And wisdom calls to us and says, don't do that. You know, trust me. Before it's too late, learn. So that's our study from Proverbs 1 today. Is the call of wisdom to get in line with the Creator and to believe and to trust and to let our faith show in our daily life that while the world is going this way and young folks, the pressure you feel, it gets easier as you get older, I think, in some ways. You're used to swimming upstream. You can get so tired you quit there too. We tried to say that this morning. But the truth is to young folks, to have the courage and the faith to say, I'm going to set my goals and we're going to steer our family by an ancient wisdom that God has given, no matter how foolish the world might think it is, because the world is lost and the world is hopeless. And we don't want to join them. So that's really what Proverbs 1 is all about. It's an ancient wisdom for a very modern problem. Going back to our text there in Proverbs 1, we were looking at a moment ago. When we try to figure out, you know, how to describe wisdom or how to think about wisdom or what wisdom is and what it does, what it looks like, I think there are three verbs in the first chapter of Proverbs that are really helpful to me in coming to terms with it. Um, He talks about wisdom in terms of knowing, perceiving, and receiving. That word to know is, is an interesting word there. Wilson defines it this way, to be sensible of by sight, by touch, but chiefly in the mind. Hence, to understand, to mark, to observe with a purpose that which comes suddenly or unexpectedly, men are said not to know. So you think about that definition, and really it comes down to a couple of things. That wisdom 
is knowing what's going on and knowing what's coming. It's sight and it's foresight. Those two things are inseparably bound into the idea of wisdom. In fact, I think if, if someone were to ask, what is the fundamental difference between wisdom and folly? I think it is that ability to see ahead. I tell you what the foolish people do. They just do it. Isn't that what the, the shoe commercial said? Just do it. That's right, just do it. Just jump. Well, what's that? Who cares? Jump. That's folly. But wisdom understands where we are, and it thinks about the consequences of what we're doing now as opposed to what's coming. You know, it reminds us so much of Luke 16. Certainly, in my humble judgment, the strangest lesson the Lord ever taught in many ways. Though I'm not being critical of the lesson, it's a perfect lesson. But just not what you'd expect at all is this lesson about this unjust steward. There was a certain rich man uh, which had a steward. Oikonomos is the word there. It's, it's a combination of two words, house and then law. So here's the house ruler. Uh, he's not ruling over his own house. He's ruling over somebody else's house. That's what a steward is, isn't it? So here's a guy watching over somebody else's stuff. The same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. But he had wasted his goods. Uh, it's another great word there. It's one of those great combination words in the original language. I don't know much about the language, but I love the words. And uh, it's a word which describes the idea, dia, through, and then the word for scatter, to scatter through. We have an expression, we talk about something slipping through people's fingers, you know. Or we might picture some, you have a child, for example, and you say, now, uh, take this bucket and take the water and take it from here and put that water over here. And of course, you know, with the child, they got more water on the ground than they ever get over to where they're supposed to take the water. It just, it goes everywhere. And that's the idea about him as a steward. He was a steward, all right, but he was not careful with his master's goods and everything is, is slipping through his fingers. And so he called him, the master did, and says, How is it this that I hear of you? Give account of your stewardship. You may no longer be steward. In verse 3, the steward said within himself, What shall I do? My Lord takes away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig to beg. I am ashamed. We pointed out many times uh, he was ashamed to beg. Apparently he wasn't ashamed to steal because the next thing we find is he said, I'm resolved what to do that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. And so he called everyone his Lord's debtors and uh, he said to the first, how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. And he said to another, how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take thy bill and write four score. You see what's going on here. And so, verse 8, here's the turn. The Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. I have met a couple of young fellows who tried to convince me this guy really wasn't unjust. I said, well, you got a problem with verse 8. He was a crook. So why does the Lord praise a crook? One reason. He doesn't praise his crookedness. By the way, later on, of course, they just lambast Jesus. The enemies do. Do you not think the Lord understood what they would do? Of course, he turned it around then and said, you're the ones who think that I'm being a libertine? The way you handle the law of God? He knew the way some people would take this, you know, the way the parables were. There were some people who would hear it and just pass it off and move on and others who were honest who would take it in. So for the honest, what's the lesson here? It's not cheat and get ahead, but it is this, that this man was wiser than the children of light because he had enough sense to see where he is, what's going to happen, and what he would need to do now to be ready for then. That's the essence of wisdom, to think about the consequences, to consider the uh, the. Uh, results of our behavior, not only on ourselves, but on other people. And he calls on us to have that same kind of, of, of foresight that is so necessary in order to live and please God. 
So wisdom is about knowing. It's about seeing and seeing ahead. It's also about perceiving. That's a great word as well. It's defined, the background idea of the verb is to discern. It includes the concept of distinguishment that leads to understanding. The verb refers to knowledge which is superior to the mere gathering of data. It is a power of judgment and perceptive insight that's demonstrated in the use of knowledge. And, and if you're like me, when you read those words, you think about the eye doctor somehow. <laughs> Discerning, distinguishing, perceiving. Because that's so very much like what the eye doctor is trying to find out is how much you perceive. And he'll test you in various ways. Some of you guys have taken the colorblind test. I found out a few minutes ago that um, we have a resident scholar here who is colorblind. Um, he sees the Bible pretty good, uh, I'd say, from my experience. But he's so, And some people do. It's interesting, isn't it? This is the colorblind test, or one of them. And uh, what is it? It's a circle of circles. And if you're colorblind, that's all you see. But if you have the full range of color, then you see more than that. Two people sitting on the same bench, and one guy sees nothing, and the other guy sees a number there in the midst. That's the idea. Now, two people look at life, and they're just side by side, but one sees more than the other. Why? Because that's what wisdom is about. It teaches you to see, to perceive. A great example of that to me uh, would be the, back in the story of the temptation of the Lord. We remember in uh, Matthew chapter 4, one of the accounts there of the Lord, he was driven, Mark says, into the wilderness by the Spirit. And um, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. And the tempter came, verse 3, and said to him, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. As a young student, I'd read this passage, and I would, I would be mystified. I mean, I, I, I'm not doubting the Lord made the right call, but what was the problem here? Wasn't he the son of God? Yes, he was. Was he ashamed of that? No, he wasn't ashamed of that. Uh, was he hungry? Yes, I'm sure he was hungry. Is anything wrong with making bread? Did he not multiply later on bread for thousands? Yes, yes he did. Who's against bread? Not me. So what's the problem here? <laughs> I mean, some of the, you know, the, the temptation to bow down and worship me, it doesn't take, that's as subtle as a train wreck. But what about this? Where's the problem? Every time you remember the Lord takes uh, us back, quoting to the devil the book of Deuteronomy. And, uh, and here, Deuteronomy chapter 8, he quotes from this passage, verse 1. All the commands which I command thee this day shall ye observe and do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear to your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness, to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee. And suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee to know, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. What Jesus' refusal was about, was a recognition of the fact that it was the Spirit who had led him into that wilderness, and it was God who was teaching him in this wilderness to learn to trust him. He's not here against self-reliance, but to work a miracle would suggest he had a doubt that his father would take care of him. And just like Israel was led into the wilderness to learn to lean on God and not their own ingenuity and their own wisdom, the Lord knew that's the course he ought to take. Now, I'll tell you, it takes certain perception to make that connection, it seems to me like. But that's the point, you know, that um, 
Wisdom is what allows us to see the hook in the devil's bait. And if we don't have that, then we're going to make a lot of messes. Wisdom is perception. Wisdom is also reception. Going back to our text. To receive instruction. Wilson says simply, to take what is given as a charge. You know, it is a problem. I think it's a problem in the way that we raise children in our Western culture. Uh, we, we, children don't learn how to take orders. They don't learn how to follow instruction simply because they're told to do something. It's got to be explained to them all the time. Oh, they've got to be brothers up for a vote. What do you think? And I think that has a, a, a tremendous effect on the reason why, you know, when kids get a job somewhere, they quit immediately because they're not used to being told what to do. And it has an effect religiously because people are just not used to being told what to do. They think, well, I get a vote too. Let me tell you what I think about what God says about this. It doesn't matter. And so learning how to take as a charge the Word of God, that the Word of God is not a book of suggestions, uh, is a critically important part of wisdom. Uh, in, in James chapter 1, it's a great passage, uh, where James, the old King James translation, writes, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. Let me pause to make a point here. You know, I have through the years, and this is personal, but I'll share this with you. I have found it to be a help to me to make this into a prayer that I try to pray every morning as soon as my eyes get open and I realize I'm awake before my feet hit the floor because I need this so badly. Lord, today help me to be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to write. And, and I, I, I mean that at least in part in reference to you. Help me not to talk over people. Help me to listen when they talk to me. Help me to be able to control my temper. But I think in context we could say this may have reference to God. Help me to learn to be quiet before God and to listen to God. Lay apart all filthiness and all superfluity of naughtiness. What a great expression that is. Every remnant of evil. And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. You've heard meekness defined through the years and rightly so. It's not weakness, but it's strength under control. Strength under control. And to have the self-control to say, I will be directed by God. And He will lead and I will follow. Be doers of the word. Not just hearers, but doers. To let that word direct me and in my conduct that it makes a difference. This is what wisdom demands. Receiving with meekness the engrafted word. Um, you know, children as they mature grow to understand that it's their job to obey and to do so with the right attitude. It's an essential part. Humility is an essential part of obedience, which is an essential part of wisdom. James chapter 3 is where he talks about the wisdom uh, that uh, is earthly and sensual and devilish. And that's the wisdom that's rebellious. Later on in the fourth chapter, we divide the book into chapters, but later on in that same thought, he talks about the key being to submit yourselves, verse 7 of chapter 4, to God, draw nigh to God and He'll draw nigh to you. Be afflicted and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned to mourning and joy. To heaviness, humble yourself in the sight of God and He'll lift you up. So the humility to submit ourselves is critical in our quest for wisdom. And all of us can do this and must do this. In Proverbs 1 and verse 5, we read a moment ago, this applies to those who are wise. That's what I would say to the wise folks in this audience. Have the wisdom to understand that you need to grow. I don't care how smart you are or how advanced you are as a Christian. There's room for growth. Isn't that the great lesson that Peter taught? 
the last letter we have there, the last thing he said was, grow in grace and in knowledge. He talks to the steadfast there. Grow in grace and in knowledge. Elders need to grow. The deacons need to grow. The older people here need to grow in wisdom. And make that your ambition and my ambition to do so. But it's also a great thing to know that uh, for those who are not wise, there is hope. And, and just quickly going back over to Proverbs chapter 1, we did read down in verse 20. But wisdom cries out. Wisdom utters her voice in the streets. She cries in the chief place of concourse. In the opening of the gates, she utters her words. She is accessible. She's not on a mountaintop far away, but right there where we can, can access wisdom. And she wonders out loud, why is it? How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? And scorners delight in their scorning, and, and the fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you and make known to you my word. Even for folks who are not wise, he talks about three categories here. The simple, I guess, would be the best off of this lot. Simple, simply open-minded, seducible, gullible, or naive. We've all heard the old expression, you know, be open-minded, but not so much that your brains fall out. That's a good point. And, uh, and there is a naivety that some people have. Well, i tell you sometime about my experience in, in, in the fair, my experience with gambling. My, my wild life of gambling ended when I was about six years old, and the guy at the fair took all my money on some game. I figured out at six years old, those guys weren't trying to help me out. Uh, that's helped me through the years. It's a painful lesson at the time. But you know, when it comes to spiritual matters, we can't afford to be gullible. If we had time, we'd go back to this great story in, uh, in 1 Kings 13. And, uh, and I, this is the story of that prophet that God sent up to Bethel uh, to, uh, to condemn Jeroboam and his calf worship there. And he did so. And he told him, don't you come back the same way. Don't eat with anybody while you're there. And that's when an old prophet came along and lied to him and told him, well, the plan's changed. And he believed him. He believed him. You know, I've met people who think that God was too mean on this guy. Because ultimately, he didn't make it home. He was killed before he ever made it home. And people say, oh, God was so harsh on him. God spoke to him and told him what he wanted him to know. And then somebody else came along and said, well, you don't have to worry about that. Let me tell you, that happens today. We all got this book. And we listen to somebody else who says, oh, don't worry about that. I don't think God's going to be any kinder to us than he was to this man. You are to be blamed. It is a condemning gullibility that you have. You turned away. You should have been wise. You should have come to me if you had a question. Gullibility. But even the gullible, if they'll recognize their problem and turn, can be helped. The fool is, I think, further down the list. I, you know, you, you read the definition uh, in these, uh, these lexicons of the word kazil here, and they say fat and stupid. And I think that's getting personal. But uh, he's talking here not about the exterior. He's talking about our fat-headed, as we sometimes say. They can't be touched. They can't be pricked. They're too dull in their thinking. That's the idea. And it's a serious matter. Wilson ties it with ungodliness, the man who just doesn't think about God. He's just going along with his life and his own wisdom. Proverbs chapter 1 talks about that man and describes him this way. Wisdom is directly in front of a man of understanding, but the eyes of a fool look all around. He looks everywhere but where he should look. He can't see because he's not focused as he ought to be. He's a fool. A fool does not find joy in understanding, but only in expressing his own opinion. He's that guy, you know, you've heard the, the saying, if you ever talk to a fellow and he says, you can't tell me, believe him. That's right. You can't tell him anything, and the Lord can't tell him anything. Nobody can tell him. 
But even a person who's in that position can soften their heart. They can change. Even the scorner, that's the lowest of these, isn't it? the mocker, the man who doesn't take righteousness seriously, he's so filled with himself that he looks down on things that are holy. Even that man, there's a chance for him if he will yet to be reached and yet to change his mind. Don't we read that in the Scriptures? We read about a thief on the cross who uh, cried out against God, about, who mocked Jesus, and yet who in the end was saved. We read about Saul of Tarsus who likewise, uh, he describes himself as injurious, the old King James says. He was a man filled with pride, but he likewise was turned to God. We can turn. That's what the text says there back in chapter 1. Turn you at my reproof. Even these can turn. But there is a too late. Back in Proverbs 1 and verse 24. Because I have called and ye refused, and I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but ye have said it not my counsel and would none of my reproof, I will also laugh at your calamity and I will mock when your fear comes, when your fear comes as desolation and your destruction comes as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then shall they call upon me and I will not answer. And they shall seek me early, but they will not find me. For that they have hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. I want to be clear here. I don't think this is God speaking per se. And saying, once you sin, don't come call into me. I, I don't think this is a passage that denies the mercy of God. That's not the point at all. I think this is wisdom personified. And I believe the point of the passage is what wisdom is saying here is that that I will teach you and instruct you and save you from all kind of trouble. But if you refuse to hear me, young people, if you refuse to hear me, then nothing can save you from the consequences of your action. He doesn't mean you can't be forgiven. But he does mean that there are going to be some things that you brought on yourself that no man can take off of you. As an old uh, expression it goes something like this. We can choose the road we take. We can't choose where the road goes. You know what that means. It's my choice whether I go down this road or not. But where it goes, that's, a, that's an empirical fact. It leads where it leads. There's a Bible expression. Whatever man sows, that will he also reap. And uh, Hosea, you remember Hosea said, They have sown to the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. The old preachers used to say, uh, it doesn't make any sense, folks, to sow to the whirlwind and then pray for a crop failure. I say, no, it doesn't work that way. And that's the point of Proverbs chapter 1, is that there may come a time when you have crashed through every barrier and you're just going to have to live with the consequences of your actions. I'm trying to save you from that, he said. Understand. That old saying, it's easier to get forgiveness than it is to get permission. Well, that's the devil talking. Because there's some things that you do that are going to cost you dearly. And he gives an example here, and I'm, I'm closing here. But in Proverbs chapter 1, this is a modern speech translation, and verse 11, he gives in this context an illustration of what he's talking about. Suppose they say, come on, let us find someone to kill. Let's attack some innocent people for the fun of it. They may be alive and well when we find them, but they'll be dead when we're through with them. And we'll find all kinds of riches and we'll fill our house with loot. Come and join us and we'll share what we steal. My child, don't go like with folks like that. Stay away from them. They can't wait to do something bad. They always are ready to kill. It does no good to spread a net when the bird you want to catch is watching. But these people, they set a trap for themselves. A trap in which they will die. Robbery always claims the life of the robber. This is what happens to anyone who lives by violence. 
Now I tell you, that was written 3,000 years ago. That happened in Birmingham yesterday. I promise you. I hadn't seen the news, but I'm sure it did. That happens every day. And young people who grow up a lot of times, sometimes at least, in homes that are unstable, and they're looking for somebody to take them in, or they join a family of thieves and criminals, and the same story is repeated over and over again. Let me share one story with you before we close. This headline is 20 years old, and it may seem rather run-of-the-mill. Alabama inmate executed. This is a headline, AP headline from Atmore, Alabama. That's where the prison is down there on the Florida line. And that's the execution site in the state of Alabama. A man convicted of killing a young girl during a robbery and kidnapping was executed in the state's electric chair early Friday. David Ray Duran, 37, was the first inmate to be electrocuted uh, since the Supreme Court agreed in October, so and so. Duran was convicted of murder for the 1983 shooting death of Kathleen Bedsoe. 16. He kidnapped the girl and her boyfriend, Chuck Leonard, from Leonard's park car, put them in the trunk, drove them to a secluded area where they were shot. Leonard, they thought, he thought they were both dead. Leonard survived, went to get help, pointed him out a few hours later when he was picked up, and just like that he was arrested, tried for murder, convicted. Old story. What's different about this story is that David Duran grew up in pews like this right here. I don't know, some of you guys may know this story, uh, but he, he went to, to church with his parents at Huffman down in the Birmingham area. And after this came out, of course, it was a great tragedy for this family, these victims, and a great shame to the family. But David had been running wild for years. I don't know David's parents. I know his grandparents were, were faithful Christians. And he went with them when he was younger. But he fell in with the wrong crowd. While he was in prison, uh, some folks contacted him, Christians contacted him, fellows like Joe Corley and others. I know a lot of people wrote him. Uh, he wound up being baptized in prison. He was executed for his crime. But during the time between his conversion and his execution, he wrote, he wrote uh, several things. Uh, he wrote a, a booklet entitled uh, An Attitude Adjustment. Some of you guys may have seen this little booklet. And um, in the booklet, he, he, he deals with questions like, you know, how did I get here? <laughs> you know, how did this thing start? You know, he mentions two things early on in this. He says, in the first place, I started smoking. <laughs> uh, he said, now I know that's not connected with murder directly. The, the connection was, it was something I knew I shouldn't do and I did it anyway. And it helped to burn out my conscience. And it was, of course, that was the first of many things that he took. But he said also, obviously, I quit going to church with my grandparents. And I fell in with a local crowd. I was a small, scrawny kid that got picked on. And somehow I looked to the people that picked on me to try to find their approval. And it's that old story. But he writes years later, about after he's done these terrible things. And, uh, and it's a powerful story. He said, I was sentenced and taken to death row in 1984. And there in a cell, eight feet long and five feet wide, I finally came to the attitude adjustment I so desperately needed. His life had been just a life of rebellion. His parents tried to help him. Other folks tried to help him. Wouldn't hear it. Wouldn't hear it. I finally came to the attitude adjustment I so desperately needed. Seeing the complete disaster I'd made of my life, I focused my mind on eternity. I thought to myself how utterly foolish it would be to accept an eternity in hell that would be infinitely more miserable than, the, than what I was, I'd created in my own life and the lives of others. It is a shame, it's shameful that I did not change my attitude before destroying so many lives. That's what Proverbs 1 is saying. It's saying you can run through so many stop signs that they're just things you can't fix in this life. You can be forgiven. He wrote a lot. He wrote a letter that I've shared with our young people at North Bia. He called it a letter from death row. And I won't read it all. It's not that long. But he makes the point here as he concludes. He says, listen to me. I'm not writing this to have something to do. Uh, I certainly would 
find it unpleasant. You think it's fun for me to sit here and tell you that I murdered a 16-year-old girl because I was so strung out on drugs and booze I didn't know how to act like a responsible person? You think it's fun for me? It's humiliating. It's embarrassing. Downright painful to have to relate this to someone. Learn from my mistake. He says, maybe you realize the perils of peer pressure. You're not involved with drug. Good. You're on the right track. Maybe you know someone you care about who's walking that dead end street. Share this with them. Maybe you're hanging out with the wrong crowd. Maybe it's influencing you to do things you know are wrong. He said, I've cost an innocent girl her life, and I've ruined many lives. Learn from my mistake. I sincerely hope what I've shared with you today is responsible for saving someone's life. I pray God. I don't, I don't know if that we're, uh, the folks I'm talking to today are just in danger of joining a gang this afternoon. It may be some other issue. He also in Proverbs talks about making the wrong choice with companions. Talks about the danger of adultery. There are all kinds of choices in life. Listen to wisdom. Wisdom calls to you now. After the mistakes are made, we, we have to get through them. We have to deal with the consequences. May the Lord help us to see there is a better way. Proverbs 1 verse 32. We'll conclude with this passage. The turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of the fool shall destroy them. Sometimes prosperity is a greater obstacle than than adversity. But whoso hearkens unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear of evil. Each of us needs to think about where we're headed and let the Proverbs call us in the right direction. I appreciate your kind attention this morning. If you're here today, you're not a child of God. Why not today become a Christian? Why not today let the wisdom of God direct and rule your life The earlier the better. That's what Ecclesiastes 12 says, isn't it? The earlier the better. If you're here today and desire to obey the gospel, we'd be glad to help you. As a child of God, if you've gone down the wrong path, return to the Lord. He longs to receive you back. Let us know how we might assist you in that as well. As we stand and sing, will you come?